Okay, well, I can at least introduce myself. So, hello, my name is Darren Lim. I am a lecturer in the School of Politics and International Relations. Um, I always like to begin these things by introducing myself, giving you a bit of my background. So I'm from Melbourne. Um, I grew up in East Melbourne, a suburb that's fairly close to Chatty, Chasson Shopping Centre, for those of you who know that. Uh, I did, uh, went to Monash University and did economics and law, double degree, did, ended up doing honours in both. Became a corporate lawyer for a little while, because why not? And it turns out that was not for me. It's a miserable existence in my opinion, and so I got out of that as soon as I possibly could. Went and worked for a, a judge, did a, a judge's associateship, um, and then found my way to the US, having always wanted to go and study overseas. Um, and then I studied a master's and then a PhD in the US. And now I'm back. Uh, you know, I, I live in Canberra because my wife works for DFAT, she's a diplomat, um, and you know, we have a couple of kids and you know, life is pretty great. Um, so that's sort of my background. And you know, you're here to learn a bit about international relations and to get a sense of what it might be like to study it or whether you'd want to study it at university. And there are a number of different ways that I could introduce um, the discipline to you. Um, and I, in my opinion, the best way of doing this uh, is to give you a mini lecture, uh, really to recreate uh, a portion of a lecture that I've given in another class, um, talking to you as if you were my students already. Uh, and it turns out the lecture I'm going to give to you, or the mini lecture I'm going to give to you, is one that I gave to my third year students in a class called International Relations Theory. So it's pretty advanced stuff. Um, but hey, you're, you know, you're intelligent, you're bright, you're enthusiastic, I'm going to treat you um, like you can handle it, because I'm sure you can. Um, and, and, you know, that will just give you a sense. I mean, if you were to take this class, it's probably about five years away, uh, but look, hey, you'll be getting a head start. And you'll be uber prepared by the, by the time um, it comes, assuming we're, you know, we're all here. Because international relations is an extremely kind of exciting slash terrifying discipline right now in this sort of, you know, Trump apocalypse that we seem to be living through. Um, and so it's, it's great for business. You know, it's never been a better time to study international relations, or in my case, teach international relations. Um, but, it, you know, that excitement is tinged by this vague fear that we might not be here in five years' time. But hey, let's not worry about that too much and let's instead talk about Brexit. Because this is other than Trump, I don't want to, you know, I'm sure you're getting a lot of Trump in class and at home. Um, let's talk about another interesting phenomenon of international relations that's been in the news lately, um, last week, as we'll mention in a second. But let's go back in time to last year um, and this bus uh, that we can see, um, it was a campaign bus that says, we send the EU 350 million pounds, let's fund our NHS National Health Service, the Britain's equivalent of Medicare, instead. And in front, and one of these two people is Boris Johnson, who is a politician. He's now the Foreign Minister of the UK, the Foreign Secretary, but the, um, he was a former Mayor of London. He was leading a campaign, as we'll see. So, Brexit. If you haven't heard about it, or you've never ever thought about it before, um, it begins with the European Union. You've probably heard of that. 28 member states um, who have this sort of very, this unique economic and political union. Um, it was formed, or at least it has its antecedents in the aftermath of World War II, when the countries of Europe looked around and said, we've been, you know, attacking and blowing each other up for the previous, well, forever basically, but in particular, a lot in the last 50 years with World War I and World War II. That's really bad. Um, a lot of people have died and we're very unhappy. Maybe we should try to set up some kind of system where we won't do it anymore. Uh, and so it began with them forming economic links with each other uh, to trade, and then over time morphed into this big political union where countries increasingly sort of gave um, elements of their own authority, their own sovereignty to this supranational organisation, the EU, so they could form common policies on lots of different things, not just trade, but you know, health, justice, climate change, foreign policy. So that's what the EU is. Um, but as the EU has matured over time and begun to perform increasing functions that are normally performed by national governments, it's become more controversial and, and, and has been criticised for taking the sovereignty, you know, the independence or the autonomy of individual countries away from them. And that was a big problem in the UK. And so prior to the domestic election in 2015, the then Prime Minister, Conservative Prime Minister David Cameron, made a promise in that campaign that if he were to be re-elected, if the Conservatives were to win again, then he would have a referendum where the British people could vote on whether or not they wanted to leave the EU. He basically did this because 
the strongest um, sort of focal point of skepticism about the EU, of criticism of the EU, was from the far right of his party. So if you think right now and you read about Australian politics, you hear of different concessions that Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull has to make to the sort of the right of his coalition government to, um, in order not to lose votes and support to you know, people like Pauline Hanson or Cory Bernardi. A similar dynamic was playing out here where you had these criticisms from the right of the Conservative Party, the equivalent of our Liberal Party, uh, and he was making this electoral promise to appease them. He wins, and so he has to fulfil his promise to have this referendum. But despite promising the referendum, he and basically almost all mainstream politicians from both sides of politics, from the Conservative side and from the Labor side, sort of akin to our Labor Party, supported the case for Remain, that the, EU, that the, that the UK should stay inside the EU. Um, and the reason they did that was because they agreed with the consensus among basically all mainstream economists that leaving the EU was a terrible idea for the UK economically. That the UK economy is so bound up with Europe in terms of trade, investment, finance, that it would just be extremely expensive and really ruin the British economy if the UK was to leave. And so that's why you had mainstream politicians on both sides, along with ma the mainstream commentariat, academics, everybody saying basically it was a terrible idea and the UK should vote to remain rather than to leave. But there was, of course, an extremely vibrant leave campaign led by a, a, couple, a handful of personalities. Boris Johnson, who you saw in that picture, uh, Michael Gove, who was a cabinet minister at the time, and a, perhaps most prominently, a man named Nigel Farage. He, is, he was the leader of the UK Independence Party. Think of him as essentially Britain's Pauline Hanson. Very similar political ideology, political agenda, and role played in British politics. The main focus of their campaign was first this idea of sovereignty, that Britain should reclaim the prerogatives of a national government that had been ceded to the EU. Uh, and secondly, the, idea, uh, the, the question of immigration. Because, of course, this is occurring amid a terrible crisis in Syria and in Iraq with the rise of ISIS and this wave of refugee flows coming up from Syria, going through Turkey and coming to Europe, some of whom um, were, you know, were arriving in the UK. And it wasn't just the refugee crisis, but immigration has long been controversial in, Europe, in, sorry, in the UK um, from within the EU. So you have lots of Polish people, for example, who have who have used the rules of the EU to legally move to the UK and there was some sense that they were taking British jobs away from, from British people. So it's long been controversial. Perhaps the most famous image of the, of the whole Brexit campaign, this is Nigel Farage here standing in front of a, a billboard which says, breaking point, the EU has failed us all. And you can see this line of what we presume are Syrian refugees lining up, you know, the implication or the image being they're lining up to come into our country and change our way of life. That's really bad. Therefore, we should you know, vote to leave the EU. Someone's trolling him at the same time by putting a little poster, their own hand out poster saying Britain's stronger in Europe. Um, I actually missed that when I first used this image. But this was, you know, it's very controversial because it, it really triggers a lot of um, imagery that is potentially quite racist, quite regressive, um, antipathic, antipathic towards um, Called refugees, but this was the basis of the, the, the Brexit the Leave campaign. We must break free of the EU and take back control. Okay? And you know, it works. The Leave campaign wins, much to everybody's surprise, 5248. Immediately, global financial markets, stock markets, share markets freak out. Um, they tumble, the British pound loses a lot of its value you know, overnight. Um, and there is this widespread prediction, including by the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, that Brexit will be, as was predicted, a terrible idea, a terrible um, consequence for the British economy. David Cameron, who has campaigned, the Prime Minister who has campaigned for Remain, you know, recognises that he can't leave Britain anymore, so he resigns, um, and he's replaced by Theresa May. Um, this result is celebrated across Europe by similar right-wing political movements. So think of Pauline Hanson's One Nation in the Holland and in Germany and in Austria and in Greece and in, in Italy and in Spain, um, in France in particular, there's an election this year. All these right-wing political movements who 
uh, skeptical of the EU who want to roll back their own country's participation or potentially even draw, withdraw their countries from Britain, from the EU, all celebrate. Donald Trump thinks it's a great idea as well. Um, and, but recently, after this a vote that was in June of last year, last week, which is why it's been in the news, Prime Minister Theresa May has formally sort of triggered what's called Article 50 of the EU Treaty, by which um, a two-year clock to negotiate the terms of Britain's exit is, is begun. And so in two years' time, Britain is leaving the EU no matter what, but the, both sides have two years to negotiate the terms of that in exit. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, all of Britain's trade agreements have to be essentially renegotiated because all of the things that you can do inside the EU, like move goods, people, money across borders, now Britain becomes its own separate entity apart from the EU, and so therefore they have to negotiate the terms of new trade agreements, new agreements on, on finance, and the movement of people, etc. So um, it's tricky, it's gonna be a lot of work, and it's not just the EU with whom Britain has to negotiate, it also has to negotiate with the rest of the world. You know, Australia is going to have to conclude a new free trade agreement with the UK because the one we have right now is done through the EU. A lot of work. Okay, so why do we care about it studying international relations? Um, you know, Brexit's already had terrible consequences. It, it certainly did in the aftermath, um, although it's been a bit more stable since. I think the worst is still to come. So what's interesting is why would the British voters make a decision that everybody seemed to agree was a terrible idea economically, that was ultimately going to harm them? Um, and the second sort of part of that question is a lot of promises were made about what Britain could do with regards to immigration. Um, it's not clear those promises could be, can even be fulfilled even when Britain withdraws. And so, and so a, on the, in answering that question, we then sort of ask, okay, what does this mean for international relations? And here we have a few graphs, which basically show the moment Brexit vote you know, occurred, sharp downward trends in bank share prices, airline share prices, building company share prices, and the stock market itself in the UK, all just sharply dropping, freaking out at the, at the, the prospect of Britain leaving the, leaving the EU. Okay, so part of what we do in international relations is we, is we come up with explanations, with stories about what we think is going on and why. And so let me propose to you three possible factors that could have been motivating the 52% of British voters who voted to leave. One, it really was what the Leave campaign said it was about. It was about culture and, and it was about immigration, right? That voters were instinctively uncomfortable with the direction that British society was taking. They thought it was becoming increasingly unfamiliar, betraying traditional values, and that uncomfortableness sort of manifested in a... In a, in a in a, in a desire to leave the EU and a belief that leaving the EU would help restore Britain to the good old days, right? And that's more important than any economic consequences uh, that were predicted by, you know, by economists. That's one possibility. A second possibility is an economic explanation, which is that, um, sure, mainstream economists predict that it's going to be a bad idea, but, you know, for me personally, my life at the moment is not doing very well. I'm not really seeing the benefits of being part of the EU. Maybe I'm struggling to maintain employment. Maybe my wages are being stagnant for a long time. So yes, it might be bad for the British economy, but the people who lose are going to be fat cat bankers and people who live in London. And I don't care about them. You know, the EU might be leaving the EU might be bad for the British economy, but it's not going to make much difference for me because my life already sucks. I'm not doing very well economically. Maybe if we leave, it might actually do something helpful for me personally as a working class or middle class. Um, British person. And secondly, thirdly, there's a, the idea of misinformation. That um, for decades, um, certain um, media outlets, in particular the Sun newspaper run by Rupert Murdoch, had been um, selling the idea that the EU was terrible, um, that it was a burden on Britain, and that leaving um, the EU would allow the UK to sort of have its cake and eat it too, meaning all the bad things about being a member of the EU could be removed while maintaining all the good things like trading relationships, etc. And so perhaps there was this genuine belief that they could have it all, leave the EU but maintain all those benefits. Okay, so there's three possible motivations, right? And you could think to yourself, um, you know, probably all of them mattered to some extent and we'll talk about each of them in a bit more detail, but ask yourself which one do you think was the most important um, if you had to choose. So let's talk about um, each of the three of them. So the first is this immigration explanation. And it's not entirely clear 
how this works when you look into the data. Because if you were to break down the British electorate into individual constituencies, much like you have electorates in, in this country, um, it, you see some weird things. Each of these dots on the graph represent an individual constituency, an individual electorate. Along the x-axis we see the percentage of voters who voted to leave. So at this end, you have 80% of people who voted to leave, at this end, 20%. And on the y-axis we have the percent of foreign-born population inside that electorate. And what you see is the electorates that had um, the highest percentage of foreign-born um, immigrants, foreign-born population, actually were more likely to vote to stay. So the more diverse, more cosmopolitan your electorate, the more likely your electorate was to vote to stay inside the EU. So it can't be true that the people who are voting to, uh, um, to leave are looking around them and seeing lots, hordes of immigrants and saying, we don't want this here. But having said that, if we change the graph to, again, the percentage of vote to leave the EU, but now change the y-axis to how much change has there been in immigration in my own electorate, in my district in the last 10 years, what we see is that a, a, a vague relationship where the, the districts that had the, the biggest influx, the biggest change of immigrants, even if it was a, a very low base, right? Let's say you had 10 immigrants in your, in your district, in your town 10 years ago, and now you have 100, that's a tenfold increase. It might be still a very low number, but you've seen a huge increase in the percentage of immigrants in your, in your um, electorate. Those that have experienced the greatest change voted to, to leave. So maybe it was not so much the level of immigration, but it was the, the change in the level of immigrants in your community that prompted you to vote to leave. Okay? All right, secondly, let's look at the economic angle. It is definitely true that um, the poorer regions voted to leave. Here we have average um, hourly wages along the x-axis. Here we have the share of percent, the, the vote percentage to vote to leave. And we see high percentages of leave votes being associated with low wages. Whereas wealthy districts tended to vote to stay. So it's definitely true that more working class districts in the UK vote to leave. But if we think about that change dynamic, similar to the immigration angle, where maybe it was those districts that had been doing badly um, economically, where there'd been a lot of change voting to leave, we see that relationship not holding up. So here we have change in hourly earnings over the past uh, 12 years. Here we have share of voting to leave, and there's no real relationship. So whether or not you'd experienced a drop in your income or a rise in your income, there really wasn't much influence. That didn't really influence how, whether or not you voted to leave or not. So again, the evidence is a bit unclear. My favourite one, the misinformation angle, um, a couple of hilarious headlines or interesting headlines from the aftermath of the vote. Brit, Brexit remorse, Brits Google what is EU after vote call for a rerun. Right, so there were people who were voting in this referendum which was going to have huge consequences for the future of Britain, not even knowing what the EU was. Um, Nigel Farage, remember this is Britain's equivalent of Pauline Hanson, that 350 mountain pledge that was on the bus, remember, that 350 million pound pledge to fund the NHS was a mistake. In other words, we probably shouldn't have written on a bus and driven it around the country that leaving the EU would allow us to give an extra 350 million pounds to the NHS, because it just isn't true. Um, and secondly, an op-ed, so much for taking back control, one of the major um, punchlines of the, of the or, um, themes of the the Leave campaign, it's clear now that there was no plan and Boris Johnson has unleashed anarchy. So this was one of many op-eds that was written at the time basically saying the Leave campaigners, sure they had this nice idea that Leave was, a good, was something that we should do, but they had no real plan to execute what that would look like in the aftermath, meaning it's going to be really bad for us economically. All right, so here, this is the general idea that voters were basically deceived or hoodwinked by the Leave campaign thinking that it wasn't going to be a terrible thing when actually it might be, at least economically. Let me add one more complication to the mix, something that I find quite interesting. What we have on this graph is the percentile of global income distribution. So every person in the world can be put on this graph based on how much 
how much income they have. So at this end of the graph, you have the wealthiest people in the world, you know, who live in Manhattan and in the nice parts of Sydney and whatever. And in this part of the world, you have people who live in rural Africa who have nothing. So everyone in the world falls on this, on this graph of global income distribution. On the y-axis, what we have is how much your income has increased in the years 1988 to 2008. And so we see that most people in the world have experienced quite a large increase in their real incomes in those 20 years. You know, if you're in the, around the middle of the income distribution, you've seen an 80% increase in your income, real income in 20 years. Pretty good, right? If you're at the top 1% or the 0.1%, you've also done pretty well. Interestingly enough, there's really only one category of people who have actually done worse, who are poorer, or who came out of the, um, 2008 poorer than they were in 1988. Think about that, 1988 to 2008, into the Cold War, heady days of the 90s and the early 2000s, the world is getting richer. Like, we're all doing pretty well. You have trade, you have computers, you have the internet, the world's doing better. But there's this one category of people who are doing a bit worse. And if we change the graph to exclude China, because China kind of messes up the figures a little bit, we see it more starkly. This is essentially the same graph we've tried to take out. There is this cluster of people between the 75th percentile and the 85th percentile in the world who have been getting poorer over the last 20 years during the heyday of globalization rather than getting richer. The question is, oops, who are those people? Who are the people who, are do, who have been doing worse amid probably the most you know, wealthy, um, exciting time in, hum in human history, wealth enhancing, exciting time in human history? And the answer, possibly, is that they are the working class of rich countries, of the industrialized world. People who are used to work in coal mines and who are used to work in factories and have seen their jobs replaced either by machines through the process of automation and technological progress or they've seen their jobs outsourced to places like China who now manufactures basically everything that we use in daily life. And so if you used to have one of those stable manufacturing jobs or um, old fashioned mining jobs for decades and then you suddenly lose your job, your income is obviously going to go down and maybe you don't have the capacity or the opportunity to retrain for the new economy. And so maybe you are noticing this and you are starting to use your voting power to reflect your unhappiness at the state of affairs. And maybe it is these people who have been voting for Donald Trump, who have been voting for Brexit, who have been voting for Pauline Hanson um, in Australia and, uh, and, and, and deserting the mainstream parties. There's some possible um, possibility there that there is this huge sector of the electorate in wealthy industrialised countries like Australia, the US, the UK, etc., who have not been doing well out of globalisation, who have been um, seeing themselves become poorer and they are, they are now making their voices heard. Okay, so why do, why do we care? Well, we care because Brexit is a really big deal um, in terms of the history of the world. Uh, the EU was founded, as I said, kind of in the aftermath of World War II, you know, one of the two most destructive and terrible wars of history after, you know, after World War I as well. And it was this project sort of that had this high-minded goal of let's try and prevent World War III, certainly inside Europe. And if Brexit is sort of the first domino of many to fall that will ultimately spell the end of the EU, then there's a possibility that we will return to a world pre, like pre-EU where the possibility of war, maybe global war, major power war, becomes real again. And that, of course, would be really scary. Um, there are huge geopolitical consequences short of that that are relevant right now. You know, for example, one person who was very happy about Brexit was Vladimir Putin, and I'm sure you've seen him in the news over the past 12 months. He has an agenda, he has geopolitical, geostrategic goals, um, and one of them includes weakening the EU. So he's quite happy. So there are consequences in the short term with regards to politics in, in Europe. Um, but as I've said, if this is the first domino to fall, maybe the entire order, the entire system that was set up in the aftermath of World War II with the explicit purpose of preventing World War III might be starting to fray, might be starting to collapse. And that's, you know, kind of a big deal. So if we care about this and you don't want World War III to happen, 
um, then you need to understand not just what motivates you know, big players like Russia and China and the US, but you need to understand these kind of micro level processes. How voters voting you know, in the Midlands of, 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 of Middle Britain um, who maybe used to work in coal mines are voting because the decisions that they are making have consequences for some of the big issues of global order, war and peace that we study. And that's why, you know, this is why we care. Because these things affect international relations and some of the biggest questions facing you know, the earth. So what is international relations? You can probably infer from my presentation a little bit, but it's the study of how peoples and countries of the world interact with each other, how they get along, what they do. Most people think of war, and war is certainly a part of it. This is a, a scene from a, 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 you know, an urban street in Syria that has you know, been bombed to high heaven. Um, so war is definitely one of the major things we study in international relations, but of course, my little mini lecture on Brexit should, should show you that we study much more than that. Here are a bunch of sample topics, um, and you can read through those yourself. I put a couple in colours because these are things that I focus on. Um, war, great power competition, economic diplomacy is probably my major focus, but I do a bit of war and competition on the side. Um, but lots of things here, you know, trade, the UN, humanitarian disasters, climate change, natural resources, feminism, um, financial crisis, foreign aid. Lots of different aspects to international relations to it and you, know, you can pick something that you care about a lot when you come to study here and study that. Some of the big questions, lots of topics, what are some of the big questions that we ask? The biggest one, why do countries fight wars? Because we realise that World War I and World War II are pretty bad and we'd like to stop World War III. Uh, but not just interstate wars, there's a lot of wars and conflicts and bad things happening inside um, states by non-state actors like terrorists and rebels. So we ask, well, what motivates them to do, to do, um, to commit violent acts? Third, you know, why do countries impose barriers on the movement of goods through trade, movement of capital, you know, through banning investment, um, and through the movement of people, like in banning migration or restricting migration? Um, and Brexit is really a good example of, of, of a country expressing a desire to do this. Why do countries do this? Why do they impose barriers? Um, why are some countries rich and other countries poor? A study of global inequality. It's a study of economics. It's also a study of international relations. Um, and, you know, even, maybe even the most important thing, um, there are some problems facing us as a human race that can't be solved by one country alone. Climate change being, you know, perhaps the biggest one. Even if we were to reduce our carbon emissions in Australia to zero, that obviously wouldn't solve the problem of climate change. And so there are these kinds of global problems that require countries working together to solve. And so we study, well, how does it happen? When can countries work together? What, can we, what kind of policies and structures can we create to facilitate that kind of international cooperation? Right, so these are some of the big questions. Um, here we get to the marketing part. I mean, you're all from Canberra or the surrounding region anyway, I think, so you probably want to come to ANU anyway because it's close to home. Um, Monash was just down the road for me, that's why I went to Monash. But we are also an excellent place to study independently of being close to where you live. Um, ranked very highly in the world, number one in Australia. Lots of flexibility in the degrees, lots of opportunities to go and study overseas or do internships, etc. Um, and of course, being in Canberra, where the federal government is located, also provides a lot of interface and opportunities to interact with the policy making process. You know, I was at the US Embassy on Monday for the launch of a report. Um, you know, I, I often go and speak to various political types um, about, and, and indeed embassy people, from, about the issues that I study on. And I try to reflect those interests of, of government, politicians, and, and foreign, uh, foreign governments in my teaching as well. Um, and, you know, we do, these are some of the, the topics that the staff who work in the School of Politics and international relations study on in their own research time. Um, lots of different, you know, different topics here that they, that they specialise in. I'll put this one in bold because this is what I do, economic statecraft and national security. So in addition to having the opportunity to study topics that interest you, you'll have an opportunity to work with academics who are themselves are studying a diverse array of problems in much greater depth. Finally, um, you know, like so much of, of the knowledge that exists in the world, if you wanted to go and learn about it, you could just Google it and read, spend a year or three reading Wikipedia if you wanted to, right? That's one way you could get, get an education. The problem with that is that there is an infinite amount of information out there. So if I ask you, well, what caused Brexit? 
why did Brexit occur and how can we stop it happening again if we think it's a bad idea, then you can go and look on Google, but it might take you a while to come up with a good answer and you have no real way of evaluating whether or not that's the right answer. You know, because and in this era of fake news that you've probably heard about, maybe talked about in class, this is an even bigger problem. So it's very hard to go and learn about the world, learn useful things, useful skills, without actually having some basis to evaluate the information that you are seeing on the internet. And so this complexity and this infinite amount of information needs to be narrowed down and, and focused. And part of that is a professional skill that is valuable in the, in the workplace. And it's something that we focus on in the international relations degree and the international relations program. You know, how to go and look for facts, right? How to, you know, what kind of evidence matters? Where do you get it? How can you attain facts about the world? Once you've got those facts, how can you arrange them and classify them in useful ways? Right, again, from making infinite, amount, infinite amounts of information into something that's more palatable, more, something that's more useful and more on which you can make decisions, give policy advice, give investment advice, commercial advice. That's the hard part of, using all, of, of, of dealing with all this information. And then once you've organised the information, then you can use it to, to say something meaningful, to try to explain the causes of major events like wars or the breakup of the EU or the failure of climate change negotiations or the refugee crisis, etc. And then you know, even make predictions about what might happen in the future. Because these are the kind of things that if you are a diplomat or you work for a politician or you work for a multinational company or you are a journalist or you work for an NGO or an international organisation like the UN, these are the kind of things you need to be able to do. Again, the answers are all on Google somewhere, but the question is can you get to them and can you get the right ones and can you get useful ones in a reasonable amount of time? That is a skill, that is what we teach here in this degree. Yes, I've just said that all that. Okay, um, I have about a minute to go. So does anyone have any questions? Yes? Uh, Britain exit. Britain's exit. Brexit, yes. Exit from the EU. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Oh, well, one more, one more. So I think that the, the economic, people inside Northern Ireland and, and Scotland probably have a greater interface with the, with the EU. Um, they more obviously see the benefits and they also have histories of kind of being on the periphery, not really being part of England, which has always been the centre of, of what Britain is. Even though Britain is all those things, um, they probably feel like less attached to the British project um, than the English do. So I think the combination of those two things probably pushed them to vote more in favour of remaining than leaving. All right, I am out of time. I'm sorry. I'll happily hang around for a few minutes afterwards. Um, thank you for your attention.